unsolvable mystery of World War I soldiers' identity has finally been solved. After several decades, forensic science has finally determined the identity of an unknown soldier who died back in 1918, Jay Silverstein, in the early hours of July 18, 1918, the Franco-American counteroffensive against German positions began at Eisenmam in northern France. The 1st Division of the American Expeditionary Force, AEF, drove the German forces back, but not without significant losses. By the end of the assault, more than 1,000 U.S. soldiers were unaccounted for. The fate of their mortal remains were unknown. And about 85 years later, French archaeologists conducted salvage work ahead of the construction job on what would have been the center for the battlefield encountered the remains of two American soldiers. One of the two men, Private Francis Lupo, was essentially identified because his name was embossed on his wallet. And he was laid to rest in Arlington National Cemetery with full mil military honors in 2006. But the other man proved more difficult. The remains of Private First Class Charles McAllister took two decades to be identified by the young, but the young man will now finally be laid to rest with full military honors in his hometown of Seattle. The burial will take place August 21st. Back in 2004, both soldiers remains were taken to the U.S. Military Central Identification Laboratory, CIL, of the Joint POW-MIA Missing in Action Accounting Command in Hawaii, where analysis of the evidence began. There is no UK equivalent of this US lab. The UK Ministry of Defense operates a small team called the Joint Casualty and Compassionate Center, JCCC. Commemorations team, sometimes known as the War Detectives. Some ad hoc identification work is also carried out by UK universities. Discovering the identity of this as yet unidentified remains of Charles McAllister, dubbed CIL 2004-101, uh, I-02 was deemed impossible at the time. Uh, the writer says, I was a forensic archaeologist at CIL when the remains arrived, and I conducted an analysis of the associated evidence. I concluded there was a high likelihood that further research could lead to an identification of I-02, and the case was passed on to historians and other anthropologists with the organization, but no headway was made. But some 14 years later, as we approached the 100th year of anniversary of the death of the soldier and the end of the First World War, I reopened the case. However, much had changed politically, and the agency in charge of MIAs and I was forced to work on it on our own time. Others volunteered to help as I went through all of the lines of evidence that could be used to establish this man's identity. Several lines of evidence could be used to narrow down the possible casualties from a list of soldiers listed as missing in action from the Eyes Marne battle and the date and location of his death, his possessions and his biological characteristics. In an ideal world, there would be a database of the missing and I could conduct a preliminary search based on his height, his dental pattern, his age and his ethnicity. Unfortunately, these data only reside within the individual military records stored in the U.S. National Archives. This meant I needed to determine a short list of possible soldiers and request their records. And the long way around? To generate the short list, I first turned to the location and time of his death. I knew when Francis Lupo had gone missing, and since they were buried in the same unmarked grave, it was an easy Assumption that they died at approximately the same time, July 21st, 1918, in the same location. Using military maps of the campaign, I overlaid the remains recovered location on battle maps and correlated them with the movement of the advance of U.S. forces. This gave me an estimate of which regiments were in the vicinity, but this could only narrow the basic list to hundreds of MIAs. The main clues were two buttons on his uniform, one stated WA, the other one had a 2 and a D and on it split between two crosses rifles, two crossed rifles. I discovered this meant I-02 had been a member of the Washington State National Guard 
2nd Regiment, Company D, before they were nationalized into AEF. There was also a medal awarded for the 1916 campaign against Mexico. As I began to dig into the records of the Washington National Guard, I found that they had served on the Mexican border, and I discovered a list of those from the 2nd Regiment listed in missing in action from France. By cross-referencing the data range of losses with losses recorded on the tablets of the missing at the American Battlefield Monuments in the Eyes Marm Cemetery with the Washington National Guard records, I was able to generate a short list of four men of Company D. It was then a matter of pulling together the military records of these four men from the National Personnel Records Center and PRC. Once the records were in hand, biometrics, physical measurements from the body, could be used to confirm his identity. Only one individual matched the stature estimated of 63 inches, 1.6 meters. Uh, P C PFC Charles McAllister. Furthermore, his dental chart included extracted first and second molars on the left and right side of his jaw, with his wisdom teeth still intact, a rather unique pattern that matched McAllister, and his estimate age also matched. Using this information, I conducted genealogical work and found a family member from his uh, matriline in Montana. Beverly Dillon knew the story of her great uncle well, and she read me the last letter he wrote as he shipped out to France from New York. Mitochondrial DNA was used, uh, is used in identification. This is genetic material separate from the nuclear DNA. It's only inherited from the mother's side and resides in the mitochondria organelles inside our cells. This DNA is passed down from mothers to their children. Beverly's mitochondrial DNA matched Private McAllister, and this gave me enough statistical data to show that it was impossible for the remains to belong to anyone else. Finally, a family member from the male line provided nuclear Y chromosome DNA sample. This is genetic material passed down from fathers to sons. The identification of CIL 2004-101-IO2 could no longer be denied. Private Charles McAllister could finally be laid to rest with military honors in his hometown, Seattle. And this is from a conversation here under Creative Commons by Jay Silverstein, Department of Chemistry and Forensics, Nottingham Trent University of the UK on Unexplained Mysteries. Please leave your comments and thank you for your support. Please support my Patreon account. The daily posts are five videos daily and they are totally different from what I have on my YouTube channel. Thank you so much for your support and that you find all my content so interesting. You'll find the Patreon account details in the description box below.